Can corruption in Central America be cured? Amid some of the world's highest levels of inequality and violence, honest leadership is needed more than ever. With highly unexpected election results in Guatemala and a presidential candidate sentenced to prison in Panama, we'll look at the uphill battle this region is facing for better leaders. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Central American Politics. Guatemalan President Alejandro Guillamate has met with the Organization of American States to express his commitment to ensuring peaceful elections in his country. Guatemala is holding a second round general election later this month. Low voter turnout combined with over a million spoiled ballots produced no first round winner. But the road to the runoff vote has been rocky, marked by a wave of disturbing developments. Here's a look. In Guatemala's first round of elections on June 25th, the country's progressive seed movement party surpassed expectations. Bernardo Arabello, the son of the nation's first democratically elected president, earned 12% of the vote, just behind as a conservative opponent. The shock result knocked out the ruling party's candidate, setting up a second round showdown between Arabello and leading conservative Sandra Torres. Today, this corrupt political class is facing a reality and that is that the party has a chance of winning. It means that they are going to lose total control of the system. But that success made the party a target for government investigation. A few weeks after the vote, Guatemalan federal prosecutors announced the suspension of the Seed Movement Party for alleged violations of the country's election law, citing irregularities in signatures collected to form the party. Guatemala's constitutional court ultimately reversed the decision but the party's offices were still raided by public prosecutors, causing fear over the integrity of the runoff, both nationally and internationally. We are deeply concerned uh, by ongoing efforts to interfere with the elections in Guatemala. Guatemalans deserve the right to vote uh, for their preferred candidate between the certified winners of the first round of elections on June 25th without any interference. Threats to, to arrest election officials or party officials threaten to undermine Guatemala's dem democratic process. So we're closely uh, monitoring the developments with our regional partners and international organization of head of the August 20th runoff. Arabello's runoff opponent, Sandra Torres, reacted by suspending her own campaign activities, saying she wanted to compete in the runoff under equal conditions. Of course we want to demonstrate our solidarity with the voters of the Seed Party and also with those who came out to vote for a project, their own electoral preference. We are respectful of the decision of the will of the people. We are respectful of electoral preferences. Guatemala hosted a UN-supported anti-corruption mission until 2019, when it was forced out of the country. Since then, the government has replaced anti-corruption figures with party loyalists, sparking anger within the nation. And the latest attempt at interference has only further incensed the people, with hundreds gathering outside the Attorney General's office in protest. We have to demand that the decision of the sectors that voted on June 25 be respected. Whether the elites and the corrupt like it or not, the people decided and we demand that this decision be respected. The seed movement has so far survived attacks on its legitimacy. If elected, there's hope that Bernardo Arabello will restore the public's faith in what many believe is a broken political system. Well, joining me now to explore Guatemala's complicated political landscape in the lead-up to the August 20th vote are from Wisconsin, Maria Fernanda Bozmoski. She is the deputy director of the Atlantic Council's Latin America Center. Manuel Orozco joins us from Washington. He's the director of the Inter-American Dialogues Migration Program and the chair of Central America and the Caribbean at the U.S. Foreign Service Institute. And from Guatemala City is... Andrea Villagran, a congresswoman with the Seed Movement Party. Thanks all so much for being with us. You know, just when one might have argued that uh, democracy had kind of failed the people, here comes an election result that no one really expected. Arevalo was doing so poorly in the polls that actually leading candidates couldn't even be bothered to smear him. So, Andrea, I'll start with you. Is Guatemala heading toward an election with a real choice in candidates? Or is it maybe too soon to be optimistic, given what 
what's happened to your party in the last six weeks or so? Well, thank you first for the invitation. I think um, for the Guatemalan people is really um, hoping, is full of, of hope to see that a change can be made by choosing the Movimiento Semilla, which is seed movement. What we have done is break the corrupt system, basically. There is a lot of expectations, and um, what happened in June 25 was that people that went to the to the boat, went to the pools with the hope that a change can be made for a real change, um, mm. and break the basically the corrupt system. We, right. You say that, but unfortunately, parties, I mean, the voter turnout was remarkably low. You had one million people spoiling their ballots, which is actually more than any candidate received in actual votes. So let me ask Maria quickly. I mean, are you feeling good about where the second round is heading? Do you think turnout will be better in the second round? Will we really see democracy thriving? And do you think these candidates do give Guatemalans a choice? between what Andrea is saying, you know, an end to corruption and what Guatemala has experienced before. Thanks, Andrea. I think uh, you've hit the nail on the head. The results were definitely unexpected, um, but I think even the attempts that we've seen to overturn or even legally question or suspend those results have failed. And I think that that's worth highlighting because, um, we talk about Central American states being fragile, being weak. To a certain extent, we're seeing that institutions do work. Um, mm -hmm. And despite attempts to, again, overturn results, uh, the results have held. And yes, unfortunately, the campaigning season for the second round is shorter. That affects both candidates. Um, but as you point out, it the the true winner of the first round was uh, was uh, voter disenchantment, um, and and it, that's a sentiment that is very much palpable and present in the country right now. Right, uh, Manuel. Let me turn to you. I mean, do you think going into the second round, because of this unexpected result, there will be greater voter participation in the second round? And what do you expect? I mean, can you foretell the results? I mean, will you see a mobilized, poor segment of the population really come out to the polls, believing that maybe something can change this time? I think what the Malans are not exactly thinking that something is going to change. There is a certain level of cynicism among the Guatemalan electorate, and they don't the best they can to defend the democratic spirit. I think this particular second round of election will show that they are going to support one of the two candidates. Sandra Torres, on the one hand, has a strong political territorial base that gives him a, a head start in relationship to Arevalo. On the other hand, Arevalo, to a large extent, represents that democratic spirit to go back to or, or to restart a political process of democratization. It's, it's less... Um, a battle against corruption, but it's a drawing the line against corruption. And I think that those two issues are right now uh, on, a, on a tie. Whoever wins will be better off today, tomorrow than things are today. So, I mean, it's a positive step forward. It's a, it's a fundamentally important political change for all of Central America, given the political problems that these countries are going through. Mm -hmm. But I think um, Sandra Torres may win if, you know, if I were to put the conventional risk-taking propensity as to who might win, she has a higher chance. On the other hand, you're already being seeing the surprise uh, in the first round. So Arevalo may win. The Yamate government has made everything possible to ensure that the popularity of Arevalo increases. And okay. if Arevalo is being on to the the null voters, um, he may get them and win. Okay, let me turn back to Andrea. You know, we've seen this in so many countries with the kind of type of elite controlling most of the economy and then the political uh, forces that, you know, the kind of change that would actually manifest in the lives of the poorest people just never actually comes. Are you convinced, you know, Arevalo can bring this or would he 
be stopped or co-opted like so many before him? Well, what we are seeing right now is the corrupt system is trying to take us back, of course. We were we weren't expected from them. We were we were not in their map, so they weren't able unable to take it off, take us off. If we were showing in the in 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 the in the statistics before the June 25, they will try to take us away from the electoral process for the polls. But as we went through, they didn't see us coming, mm. and now they are trying everything to take it off, making um just invented cases uh, in order to attack us. But the electoral, the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, which is the highest authority in the electoral process, here declared that the um, August 20 is the day of which the second round would take place. So they declare also make the, res the results officially. And that's a great hope for the institutional process, democratic process in Guatemala. And of course, they will try, still will try to do some stuff to stop our participation. But I think that the Guatemalan people speak really loud in June 25, and they don't have any um, weapon to still trying to let us, you know, I mean, take it out from out from the electoral process in August 20. Hmm. It's almost officially that we are going to the process, and we have the best strong, which is the people that is supporting us and is going higher every time. Okay, well, well, we'll have to see what happens in the election. And like I said, if he is voted, will he deliver on the promises made? Will we see this candidate co-opted by the kind of controlling elite, as they're often characterized? But let me ask Maria Fernanda this, because as always, it seems, if you step anywhere a little bit further toward the left, you're suddenly voting for communists. You're voting for Venezuela or Cuba. So how strong is that kind of rhetoric right now in Guatemala? We have to mention it is a deeply Catholic country as well, so we may have the church playing a role in influencing voters. What do you make of, of the electorate at present? Yeah, definitely um, the church religion plays a, a big role in, in Guatemala, evangelicals, I would say. Um, actually, the Atlantic Council hosted both presidential candidates just last week, and so we got to hear from them about their proposals. Um, we asked about, you know, their relationship, how they would see the relationship with the United States um, and the rest of the region. Um, you know, I think, obviously, uh, they were speaking in public, but there is... It's such an easy target, such an easy narrative to to um, deploy uh, across social media and say that you know this candidate would turn Guatemala into uh, Venezuela, the Venezuelization of Guatemala or a Cuba or a Nicaragua. Um, it seems to me from his remarks that he's pretty um, mainstream. Uh, there's not much uh, that would kind of alarm us from with relation to the policy proposals that he has on economics, uh, macro fiscal pol policies. I, I will say we do, we would like to see more concrete proposals. And I think that that's uh, can candidate Arevalo's biggest challenge in the the few weeks that are left is to really deliver on, on concrete proposals, which uh, Sandra Torres, uh, of course, she's the perennial candidate. This is the third time mm -hmm. that she's running for president. She kind of has that, you know, behind her. She, she thought that he, he doesn't. Right. And, and it, some would say in Arevalo's defense that, you know, the time he would have had to properly lay out his platform, it was a bit derailed because of the accusations against him and having def to defend their right to participate in the second round of the election. Uh, we're down to our last few minutes, so let me get to one, one final very important issue. Uh, I'll start with Manuel here. For an international audience, of course, I mean, how does this election and Guatemalan politics in general, how does it play into the migration crisis, you know, that we're seeing manifest so strongly on the U.S. border, but it is very manifest across Central America. And a huge root of the problem is in country in a country like, like Guatemala, also El Salvador and Honduras. But Guatemala, it's a major issue there. How is this going to play into that? Well, I think it, it plays to an extent. It's, migration is not exactly a priority, a policy priority for 
governments in Central America because they are more in, in, engaged in, in the day-to-day -day politics of the polarization on the one hand and, and social problems on the other hand. Migration is a consequence of this problem. But I think Arevalo, who is a seasoned foreign policy expert, knows and understands that the relationship with the United States depends to a large extent on how you handle migration. Migration from Guatemala is, is basically being on a year basis, at least 1% of the population living every year since 2018. It's, a, it's just, you know, a whole lot of people. And what is worse is that half of the unaccompanied minors that have arrived at the U.S. border since 2018 are from Guatemala. We're talking about 250,000 minors just from Guatemala. So it is a priority for, um, for Arevalo. I don't know to what extent he knows how to tie migration with development, and that's a challenge that all politicians have. But what I can tell you is that the uphill battle is real. If he wins, he's going to have a lot of challenges dealing with a Congress that he doesn't have much coalition support, mm -hmm. with municipal governments that are pretty much on the side of current uh, President Giamatei or Sandra Torres. But I think he's going to try to build some sort of a co coalition of political support to deal with issues such as migration, okay. such as development policies and uh, corruption. Andrea, I'm curious if you can speak to that. I mean, what would Arevalo's platform really be to want to make his own people stay in Guatemala? Because it's not just, you know, a, a national interest. This is a political interest. That's more votes potentially for your party if people have incentive not to run. Exactly. We totally agree with that. We basically um, make an offer during, we are making this offer during campaign that we want to build a country where to live and to stay and to develop, with grow with your family and not have to live because you have needs that are not solved basically needs, which are health access, educational pro uh, access, education access, um, things like not running away from violence, which is what is happening here in Guatemala, not having job opportunities. Uh, we have an employment crisis which we cannot give because we don't have the conditions. And what we are trying to uh, create is first we have to provide people with the need, the basic needs. We have to make a strong effort to build institutions with health institutions, access, mm -hmm. um, educational, also attack the violence that is really high also here in Guatemala, and to create the conditions to have um, more jobs or more, more better employees um, offers. Right. And that can be just made with a strong political um wanted to do in strong policies okay. that yes. um, not steal the, the budget from corruption. So much is really needed. And I hope to be checking in with all of you uh, in the months to come to see where this all goes. But uh, for right now, that's all the time we have for this segment of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of you really so much for being with me. Greatly appreciate thank it. Thank you. Now, from the northern end of Central America to the very south, Panama. The country's former president, Ricardo Martinelli, has been sentenced to more than 10 years in prison for money laundering and ordered to pay a $19 million fine. But with an appeal against his conviction underway, Martinelli is continuing his presidential campaign for the 2024 election. What I've got planned for Panama is madness. Come with me promising to build bridges, commuter trains from border to border, and provide free laptops and internet access to every school. His enthusiasm and platform are what many Panamanian voters want to hear. But can he be trusted? Aside from being convicted of money laundering in a case known as new business, Martinelli, along with his sons, is also charged with involvement in laundering millions of dollars in bribes from Brazilian construction company Odebrecht. Martinelli, of course, maintains his innocence, saying it is all political persecution. Don't be blind. They want to kill democracy. They want to silence the vote of the majority in Panama. They are afraid of the popular vote. Well, in spite of all the scandals, convictions and sentences, Martinelli is still a popular candidate for president. Joining me now to talk about why and what could be ahead for Panama is O.K. Ornstein. 
He's a journalist who spent the better part of two decades working in Panama. He joins us now from Amsterdam. Thanks so much for being with us. You know, we see this around the world, leading political figures accused of corruption and those accused saying everything is politically motivated. But in the case here of Martinelli in Panama, on which side do you think there is more truth? Uh, well, the truth is that uh, Martinelli's uh, presidency started uh, almost the first day with a corruption scandal, and it never stopped. Um, his five years in office were uh, uh, characterized by a string of scandals, uh, constant new corruption scandals, and um, he was, in 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 a way, um, a new a, a new kind of president ab about it because he was actually proud of it. He uh, threw a party, which, according to insiders, was because he had uh, cobbled together a billion dollars in in uh, kickbacks and bribes and and business deals, as he called it. And, um, well, one of the first things he did was um, trying to get his hands on the DEA wiretap operation in Panama, which is run by the DEA with the permission of the Supreme Court. And when he couldn't get that, he bought the equipment in Panama, in Israel, and um, he started wiretapping his political opponents and uh, business competitors. And he, that was actually his first conviction after his presidency, because um, that was, of course, illegal. Right. And... Um, then there were all kinds of deals with Fin Mechanica in Italy. There were uh, yeah. that was that was well into the billion of I mean, billions the, of dollars. The, the list goes on. Uh, let me ask you this: I mean, is, right. is bad the best on offer in Panama? Because despite whatever proof there is against Martinelli, he's still popular, and you know, not dissimilar actually to Donald Trump in the United States, whom at one point I don't know if this is still the case he considered a friend and did business with building Trump Tower in Panama. Oh, yeah, they were best buddies. When Trump Tower was uh, opened, they uh, were uh, parading around the lobby. Well, not the lobby, because that was underwater at the time, but the first floor. And um, uh, there, there are many similarities between Martinelli and Trump. One of the most obvious uh, ones for ordinary Panamanians was that uh, Martinelli, before Trump was in office, already started with this governing by Twitter. So if you wanted to know what Martinelli was going to decide, you had to watch not the official channels or the, the, the official newspapers or the official uh, government websites, but his Twitter feed, because that's where he announced policy decisions. That's where he insulted his opponents, uh, very much like Trump was doing. Right. And so, I mean, do, do you think people are willing to accept a level of corruption if a candidate delivers, I mean, has Martinelli delivered? And will he actually, do you think, be able to run in next year's election? Um, well, he has delivered in a way, he has uh, completed infrastructure that was already in the works, like uh, um, a decent bus system, uh, first metro line of Panama City, which is uh, um, a, a, a hellhole of a traffic jam constantly. So uh, those needed projects he has completed and um, some roads, uh, some expansions. <clears throat> so among Panamanians, a lot of them say, uh, robo pero hizo. So he, he stole, but he but actually he made done. things work. Right. He got it done. And um, they, that, they just seem to accept. Panamanians, yeah, they if, just if seem. enough Panamanians say that to for him to be re-elected, that remains to be seen. Mm. But yeah, they seem to accept, it's, it's widespread in Panama that they accept the corruption because there is really no alternative. Bad is the best they can do. It's amazing as well that he would actually call himself a loco, the crazy one, you know, yeah. given especially another <laughs> infamous Latin American president went into exile in Panama, also calling himself El Loco, that was Abdullah Bukaram of Ecuador. Is it right. symbolic of a kind of recklessness that somehow sells, maybe even across the region? Yeah, the, the Loco thing uh, comes from he, his second campaign, which actually got him elected. And it was uh, some opponents, I don't remember exactly who it was, but uh, one of the opponents called him, well, these people are local. Um, Martinelli and his uh, 
his uh, crowd. So um, then he uh, turned that into an election slogan, Los Locos Somos Mas, we, we crazies are with more. <laughs> and uh, so he became a loco. And he, throughout that campaign and even throughout his presidency, he displayed a kind of brazenness, like um, he would just do it and he wouldn't care, damn the consequences. And, right. Um, hang out with Berlusconi in the train along the canal and just openly, um, um, uh, yeah, almost yeah. open corruption. Okay, Ornstein, so unfortunately we're out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers, but i really like to thank you so much for being with us uh, to share your insights on Panama. And of course, thank our viewers for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.